Tales of Arise recently released its huge new expansion DLC and people have been asking me to make a sequel to the No Skills Challenge run we did about a year ago. So today we ask ourselves, can you beat Tales of Arise Beyond the Dawn without art, on Chaos Difficulty, without any other forms of DLC, bonus items, mods, cheats, etc? Well, let's find out. <laughs> this is going to be rough. We start by rejecting the massive amount of free stuff the game tries to give us for having a completed story save file, lock ourselves into the hardest difficulty mode and watch a quick cutscene of new character Nazamil running away from three strange men. As always, for the benefit of viewers who haven't played the original game or this expansion, we'll try to avoid spoilers by not discussing plot details. And we'll be skipping pretty much every cutscene, but obviously we'll still be showing off bosses and locations throughout. We're now in control of protagonist Alfin alongside partner Shion in the Adan Lake region of Mahagsar. We start by unequipping all available arts, which are this game's name for skills. Not only do these include damaging skills and ultimate abilities, but also skills that buff, heal or even resurrect teammates, all of which will be banned for this entire run. But just like in our original video, anything without the word art is fair game such as boost attacks and boost strikes, many of which are mandatory to take down bosses anyway. We spend a lot of time gathering all the items from the area before heading into the game's first battle to save Nazamil. This was actually one of the fights I was most nervous about because this is the only mandatory battle in the entire expansion where we only have access to two party members instead of the entire roster of six. Alfin can perform basic attacks in combos of up to 6, with the first 3 slashes being quite fast and the latter 3 being slower but seemingly more powerful. After executing an entire combo of 6, there's a fairly lengthy pause slash cooldown period before you can execute another combo, though this can be slightly mitigated by performing a dodge roll. Our damage output is laughably pitiful so far and we can't get too greedy because enemies on Chaos difficulty deal ridiculously high damage and teammate Shion isn't able to use any of her healing arts. It's obvious that the fight against the wolf is going nowhere so we swap over to targeting the bird with Shion in the hopes that a 2v1 will help speed up the fight. It's extremely evasive though especially when it starts going for those circular bombing runs. But soon enough, Shion's boost attack comes online. Each character's boost attack has a long cooldown but has a very specific and powerful effect. In Shion's case, it's a barrage of gunfire that temporarily downs flyers. I really like how each character has a set role within the party for dealing with certain types of monsters. It gives me strong flashbacks of games like Final Fantasy X. The bird's down in just a few minutes and Shion makes sure the wolf is close behind. But yep, <laughs> another wave of enemies appears and it's identical to the first. Oh, <laughs> Luckily it doesn't take too long for us to get the bird's blue diamond stagger bar thingy all the way up so we can launch a boost strike for massive damage, one shotting the thing and dealing enough AoE damage to also wipe out the nearby wolf. Job done. With Nazmiel rescued, our adventure continues to the nearby city of Niez. We dodge enemies and quickly discover that Alfin still hasn't learned what basic vegetables are. What's this thing? Ah, it's a potato, Alfin. Upon entering Niez, we're immediately greeted by Mage Rinwell and Brawler Law, quickly followed by Knight Commander Kisara and a uh, guy with a stick, Dohalim. The gang's all here. The gang's all here indeed, but we can only take four of the six into battle at any time, so we have some tough decisions to make. I'm going to stick with the setup we used in our No Arts Challenge run of the base game by going with Shion and Rinwell for range damage, plus Hisara for the heavy defense and drawing aggro. Law goes straight on the bench as he's too much of a glass cannon, while Dohalim really isn't very good without his arts. While unequipping everyone's arts, we notice something interesting. Since this expansion story is set in the post game, each character's arts count already has a default setting value above zero. For example, it says we've already used Alphan Scarlet Inferno Mystic Art a hundred times, and Shion's first aid three hundred times, despite having only completed a single battle. <laughs> I'm pointing this out now because if we do make it to the end, I'll be showing the arts counters again, so you can be sure that there's been no cheating going on here. 
It's actually surprising how often I get people in the comments accusing me of cheating in these runs. I think the biggest offender was in the ice only challenge run of Final Fantasy 7, where a barrage of trolls tried to be clever with cheeky remarks, or even outright accused me of cheating because they spotted Cloud had Blade Beam during the second boss fight. They wrongly assumed that you need to use his level 1 limit breaks in order to obtain his level 2, but no, the only condition to obtain Blade Beam is to defeat 120 enemies, which happens incredibly quickly when you spend so much time farming enemies, so... Anyway, I digress. We don't have enough materials or gold to buy or forge anything yet, and the only quote food that we can cook is a vitamin smoothie for a slight elemental defense buff. Oh, damn, this run's gonna be rough. <laughs> Thankfully, we can now take on a few side quests, which are mostly just fetch quests or kill quests, but do offer a lot of skill points as rewards. They also help to flesh out the world a bit and offer some funny character interactions, so I'd highly recommend completing them all if you decide to play the game for yourself. Alright, enough waffling, let's get some more combat going. Okay, these Cristomadillos are a variation of the Armadillo enemy that gave us a bit of trouble back in the start of the base game, and these ones are even more heavily armoured. Alphan's boost attack allows us to temporarily down an enemy, except when it just doesn't work and we can keep up the offensive. Mobs like this are great for Kisara and her high defences. Having her in the party is a great peace of mind, because even if three of us get suddenly wiped out for some reason, having her still standing allows us to use restorative items to get everyone back on their feet. This was essential for beating the final boss of the base game, and I suspect it will be the same with this expansion too. Despite being in reserve, we can still call upon Law to dish out his armor-smashing boost attack, as well as Dohleem's hindering vines. With the first enemy boost striked and the first falling close behind, we go all out on the third Crystal Medillo with as many boost attacks as possible, including Kisara's charge-blocking shield bash and Rinwell's spell-stealing magic cancel. It's worth noting that each time an ally uses a boost attack, it partially charges Alphan's boost attack, a slightly hidden game mechanic that we'll be taking full advantage of later in the run. The second side quest mob we need to defeat are these floating tempestuous masses, another enemy variant that specialise in magic skills. These are by far my favourite enemies because they have slow, weak telegraphed attacks, relatively low HP and are quite easy to stagger. They're great for farming, even if they don't offer quite as much XP as some of the other monsters. Actually, before we go any further, let's take a quick look at each character's skill panel. Since we didn't accept any of the free stuff at the start of the run, we have almost zero skill points and therefore can't get any upgrades yet. Once we can start buying upgrades though, a reminder that completing a ring gives a character a permanent stat boost, such as attack plus 10, etc. So we'll eventually need to unlock and then immediately unequip additional arts as the run continues. Thankfully, side quests give hundreds of SP as rewards, as well as accessories such as this Black Onyx, which grants plus 15% max HP. Nice! After discovering a suspicious looking teleporter, we grab some Adan Peppers and spend the night camping out with Nazamil, treating ourselves to a social Mabo curry for some elemental defense in the process. I know we've said it before, but can we just spend a moment to talk about how gorgeous this game looks? Every location looks absolutely stunning, and it definitely sets a high bar for JRPGs going for. Whoa, 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 where did that guy come from? <laughs> we are not fighting that. Or should we? No, okay, nah. Oh, fine, I'll do it. <laughs> So-called giant zoogles are optional bosses scattered throughout the game that can be bloody tough, but offer good rewards if you can beat them. This one in particular, the level 85 Grinamuk, is an absolute tank with a wide range of heavy damaging moves. The strategy is to try to chop off its tail and limit its range of skills, Dark Souls style, but Alphen is dead within seconds. Kisar is down too, so we use our only elixir to get Alphen back on his feet, but reviving a dead teammate does reset their boost attack cooldown. From there though, well, <laughs> Let's just say the battle was an absolute wipe. It wasn't even close. Yeah, uh, let's leave that one for now. 
we arrive at the expansion's first of three new areas, ominously named Mausoleums, but we have a few bits to mop up before we head on in. Running around the Grinny Muck while it's positioned on the left hand side grants us access to a lower platform containing more ore and a red lavender herb, which permanently boosts Alphan's attack by 10, nice. Then we hand in more side quests, farm more tempestuous masses, craft a slightly stronger weapon for Alphan, invest in various skills that buff boost attack cooldowns and it's finally time for Beyond the Dawn's first brand new location, Mausoleum of the Ruins. The dungeon is kinda similar to some of those in the base game, but this weird slanted theme and light pouring in from above really give it an interesting feeling. I don't know, I just really like it. There are some new armour sets available for each character here, as well as plenty of enemies to keep us entertained. These charging boars have a decent chunk of health and can close in on you pretty quickly, so it pays to keep them in view and never turn your back on them. Meanwhile, tempestuous masses have been replaced by these ominous earthen masses, which are slightly more resilient versions of their predecessors. We need to start being a bit more conservative with Rinwell's magic cancel boost attack now, because using it to actually cancel a spell reduces her cooldown and gives her a buff, whereas using it randomly when no enemies are even charging spells puts it on a significant delay. Having the game reward judgement and skillful timing like this is awesome, it really raises the skill ceiling of a game like this and opens up many more possibilities. I do have a plan for this, but again you'll see what I have in mind a bit later on. <laughs> in my opinion the toughest enemies in the dungeon are these apes, their damage output is insanely high and they love to jump around the arena either to dodge your attacks or to land powerful slams, many of which have the potential to one shot a character. Thankfully Dohalim's boost attack vines can make their legs green, limiting their movement but even with this debuff they're incredibly strong and highly unpredictable. Three party members are down and only Shion remains so we swap control over to her rather than relying on the AI. She can attack at range which is helpful but with such low damage output this, uh, <laughs> this is going to take a while. By the way I should address the suggestion a lot of people gave in the no arts challenge run of the base game, just swap in the two reserve party members, seems sensible right? Well not necessarily, I actually explained this briefly back in the Almadria fight but the reason we're not currently swapping in Law and Dohalim is because we currently have unlimited access to their powerful boost attacks. If we swapped them in they'd almost certainly die very quickly, <laughs> especially Law, and their boost attacks would die with them, making the fight take even longer. There's arguments to be made for and against, but personally I prefer to keep those two in reserve as it maximises player agency and so, in my opinion, gives us the best chance of winning. Not every battle goes so well though, so it's time for us to go and forge some slightly better weapons and farm weaker enemies until we hit level 69. It's at this part of the mausoleum that we hit the game's first major roadblock, a battle against seemingly endless waves of spawning enemies. It starts with just four on screen, <laughs> I say four like it's not a big deal but this is a really nasty mix of enemies. It's really tough to get an angle on them without getting surrounded but we do manage to separate one from the group and kill it within just a minute or so. After our first boost strike though the game throws additional enemies into the ring while we're still fighting the original ones. We just get battered around from all directions and it feels incredibly overwhelming. I feel like if you could just somehow instruct your allies to all focus the same target things would be much easier but no, party members just keep dying and we're burning through items at a rapid rate. Eventually we get down to just Alphan and mere apple gels and all things considered I think we put up a pretty good fight. The problem is that his boost attack actually hurts himself every time he uses it and without Shion's healing arts this battle of attrition simply cannot be beaten yet, there's only one thing for it, we need to grind some more. Thankfully the enemies in this mausoleum give good amounts of XP and items so we just keep the fights going in order to keep the battle chain bonus up while listening to YouTube in the background. At level 72 we're back for another attempt. 
Our equipment is pretty weak because we're way too poor to craft accessories yet, but investing in Alphan's KO prevention skill alongside the near death attack slash elemental attack buff is an amazing combo because our HP can safely drop to 1 HP per fight while rewarding us with a huge damage bonus. For Xion we go with boost strike damage and raise her basic attack combo limit, we give Rinwell KO prevention because she's kinda squishy and Kisara gets KO prevention increased counter attack damage. For Law and Dohalim it's all about decreasing their boost attack cooldown and raising the damage. Alright this is looking good but will it be good enough? Let's rock. The fight begins and we immediately go for the most dangerous enemy, the Ape. Dohalim's vines make its legs green and we deal a decent chunk of damage before being flanked by the boar and forced to reposition. We instead turn our attention to the weakest member, the ominous earthen mass, with Law's boost attack enough to secure our first boost strike. Go for it. Prepare to crumble. We have to keep up the aggression here because the moment we let up the enemy will gain the advantage and things will quickly go downhill. The ape is the second to get boost striked. Wait, boost striked? Boost struck? Eh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but yeah, we're just cleaning up the stragglers of this first wave now, and a grape gel helps Alphan stay out of one shot range. Oh, oh wow, we just kind of wasted Shion's boost attack there. Eh, but I suppose it helps charge Alphans up. A boar separates itself from the pack so we can capitalize on it and quickly down the thing. Things are looking dangerous again though, as enemies are everywhere, including another ape, so we use a treat to keep everyone's health topped up. A reminder that you can only carry 15 of each consumable in this game, so it's not like you can just cheat death by holding infinite amounts of healing items, oh no. You really have to think carefully about when to use each one. That and healing items are bloody expensive, with some of them costing 80 grand each, oh yikes. Alphan gets jumped by an ape, but we keep the boost strikes coming. <laughs> oh my lord, when will this fight end? <laughs> These shellfish crab thingies are insanely tanky and take even less damage from the front, but Law's boost attack absolutely decimates them, so that's another one down. Next we go all out on the ape, carefully timing Alphan's boost attack for when it's standing up animation is about halfway through so that we can immediately knock it down again as soon as it gets back up. This is a strategy that we'll be using a lot in a certain fight later on. We somehow get a boost strike off and the AoE damage is enough to wipe out the last of the mob. Woohoo! GG! With the mob cleared, we can now push deeper into the mausoleum. We pick up an elemental guard, which actually has worse elemental defense than regular equipment, and go up against this secret level 99 Kiami Ooze enemy. These things are really hidden and difficult to find. I think I've only ever found like two, but they give incredible rewards if you're able to beat them. Their gimmick is that all attacks deal one damage against them, and they can one-shot you. Their attack rotation is pretty predictable though, they sit AFK for a few seconds, then jump at someone, then sit AFK again, rinse and repeat. Needless to say, it takes quite a long time to take down, but it isn't too challenging. Like most stat boosting items in this run, it all gets used on Alphen, since he's the one that we're mostly going to be controlling. Time for the first boss of the run, Nimus Pandemonium, which is actually just a reskin of that Valclinimus boss back from the main story. A bit of a shame that this first boss is just a reskin considering it's quite an expensive DLC, but eh, whatever. The gimmick is that we have to down the thing in order to gain access to its weak point, the head. The problem? Well, it just loves stomping down those big chunky legs, and our AI teammates are ridiculously stupid in this fight, so they just walk right into the damage again and again. Because of this we eventually get to the point in which it's a strict 1v1 against the beast, but we get unlucky with our dodge roll timing of its jump and get wiped. Ouch. We go away to craft better weapons for everyone, in some case best in slot, as well as improving our allies boost attack cooldowns even more, because we're going to need to keep that Nimus pandemonium downed as much as possible if we are to have any chance of beating this thing. So after chowing down on Law's wiener for a temporary attack boost, we're back at level 73 for another attempt. Fingers crossed everyone, let's do this. 
Within seconds of the fight starting, our allies are already taking heavy damage, but I forgot to pre-charge our boost attacks, so I suppose I'm also to blame for what's happening so far. Dohalim and Law get in there, and we get Shion healed up a bit while Kisara tanks the aggro. It goes for its first jump, triggering two allies as once per life KO prevention passive already. We use more allied boost attacks to allow us to use Alphans for the first time so far, but Rinwell is dead, which is a shame because her damage would have been super useful right now, but it's fine, she soon gets rezzed by a life bottle. This cycle continues until we are, once again, in a 1v1 against the thing and it's powered up. We can just keep our distance to avoid the majority of its attacks, it's only really the jump that's a threat. Again, we don't switch in Dohalim and Law because we'd rather have unlimited access to their boost attacks than have them come in and die within seconds, so we just have to be patient and look for windows of opportunity. We drop to just 1 HP, so use the last of our life bottles on our allies for one final push, which is just enough to take it down before it starts wiping everyone out again. Ho <laughs> ho! Job done. With one mausoleum down, we can push on to Beyond the Dawn's second city, Vicint, in Elder Men and Seer. Things are much brighter and more upbeat here, and we now have access to the training grounds. This is great news because of the defensive and offensive medicinal herbs group battle challenges, which can be repeated every hour for infinite permanent stat boosting items. But they're a little bit too tough for us right now, so we just grab the few scraps from Alphen's novice solo battle and push on. After finding two grand just sat on a random seat in the palace, we continue to ransack the place for everything not nailed down. We discover even more typos, yes this DLC continues the theme of the localization team not knowing how to check for basic spelling and grammar mistakes, <laughs> and we kick off some battles on the Trislida Highway. Most enemies here are reasonably weak and offer very little challenge, but give good amounts of XP. By the way, it's worth noting that the vast majority of the field areas available in the base game are not present in the DLC. Almost every region has only a single enemy area, with many being cut out as it just teleports you straight to the next city. While this might seem like a big downside, I understand why they did it, and I think it's actually a good thing. It makes the expansion feel more tight and story driven, rather than having players randomly wandering around empty areas that they already explored back in the base game. We somehow take down Adan Lake's optional dragon mini boss before fighting the game's second main story boss, the Venaflage, who has been terrorising the local ranch. We're level 74, which may seem pretty high, but for anyone who remembers us fighting this boss back in the base game, you probably remember how useless our teammates were against this thing. They just get absolutely wiped, so we really need to push the offensive, and it'll probably end up as another 1v1 situation against the thing, but let's see how things play out. This chameleon thingy is big but super agile with a wide variety of moves, from charging and screeching to turning invisible and tongue whipping everywhere. When it chucks acid around, we can actually use this to our advantage by deliberately dodge rolling into the thing to trigger a powerful counter attack. Again, we'll be using this strategy a lot against later bosses. It powers up blue with only 10,000 health remaining, so honestly this fight could go either way. We have to dodge as much of its charge as we can before pushing the attack when it finally stops. After just 7 minutes, the boss has fallen, we've saved the ranch and we're one step closer to beating the run. We complete more side quests, get shot at, have a temper tantrum, enter a cow, strike a pose, and push onto the absolutely gorgeous yet confusingly named Cisladen, capital of Cislodia. I love how there's some great pieces of armour hidden around in this town if you're willing to go off the beaten path and explore every nook and cranny. Here's some of the ones that I found anyway, so feel free to grab them on your next playthrough because they're a fairly big step up from the previous set of armour. We visit the Owl Forest where King Owl has monopolised the selling of certain items for... How much? <laughs> I am not paying that. <laughs> Spoiler, we did end up having to pay that. <laughs> we enter another cow, help these guys through the Rudia forest for more juicy SP and gold, and we can push straight on to Ulzebek in Calaglia. 
Each of these areas feels really far apart in the base game because you're forced to do the long journey between each, but in this expansion it literally teleports you straight from Messier 224 all the way to Ulzebek, which is a pretty big time saver. Okay, let's see what the enemies here have in store for us. We found a pack of two golems here, specifically the rare golden variants, and as expected they're ridiculously tanky for a regular mob. We tried to stay behind one of them to directly damage its orange crystal weak spot as well as downing it with Alphen as much as possible. We eventually break the core but just can't seem to get that blue diamond boost strike bar all the way up yet. In fact we never do and it eventually just falls to regular damage. Ok only one golem left but our allies are all critically low and I really don't want to use more healing items on them because as previously discussed healing items are insanely expensive and will eat into our weapon slash accessory forging budget. A celsius fury boost strike eventually wipes the thing and we're rewarded with more than an entire levels worth of xp, oh nom 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 very tasty. We now start to see these icons on the minimap. Basically each party member has two optional character subquests to complete, and if you manage to beat both of them then that character's boost attack receives a fairly significant upgrade. I think it goes without saying that we're going to need to beat all of these things if we're going to have any chance of beating this run. We return to Niez to find that all of the citizens have been forced to wear an iron mask, oh no. We need to find out who did this and put a stop to them, so we head to the newly unlocked Thislam where... Wait, wait, was that a cow? Okay, where we enter a cow... And another cow... <laughs> wait, can we do that bull too? Come on... Yes! <laughs> Let's go. Alright, we've had our fun, so it's back to side questing for another hour or so. I'll skim through it because like 95% of this run was just beating side quests or farming enemies for XP and you guys probably don't want to sit through all that so let's just get back to the next big challenge of the run, Law's optional 1v1 against his father Zephyr. This is one of his two character subplots so it would be really helpful if we could beat it, but without art we're at a serious disadvantage against our foe. I almost never play Law so I'm pretty rubbish with him so <laughs> I'm sorry for the terrible gameplay here. We just have to quickly learn and start responding to Zephyr's diverse moveset and are able to quickly end the fight with a counter attack in just 10 minutes. With all side quests completed it's time to head on into the second new dungeon, Mausoleum of the Jungle. This place is absolutely massive, full of new ores, items and armours and the enemies are at a nicely difficult power level to keep us on our toes. There are some optional bosses here guarding new weapons, but the weapons are strictly worse than the ones we can forge ourselves so there's absolutely no incentive to fight them, it would just mean burning through more consumables at a significant cost to our wallet. Wait is that a waterfall? Oh come on gamers we all know what that means, <laughs> let's check it out. Oh yep a treasure chest hidden behind the waterfall, nice. <laughs> Time for the game's next main story boss. After discovering our friend Nazmiel here having some sort of panic attack, It's because I was useless, wasn't I? Why do you despise me? We try to help her by, well, beating her up in a 6v1. <laughs> Nazmiel has well over 700,000 HP, but I'm not complaining because this is by far my favourite boss fight in the entire expansion. Nazmiel is armoured, can teleport around the arena and has a very wide range of skills and spells at her disposal. As always we try to push the offensive to never let her gain the upper hand, but downing her with boost attacks can be risky as she always uses a blue AoE blast upon getting back up, meaning anytime we down her we either have to chain the downs or be prepared to quickly back up as soon as she's back in the air. I'll speed up the footage a bit here because the first half of this boss fight is fairly straightforward. As always I'll upload the full unedited boss fight footage on a Patreon and another big thank you to all of these kind individuals for supporting the channel, really appreciate all of you. We're down to 11 life bottles and one single treat as we resurrect Kisara and get everyone healed up ready to push on to phase 2. Nazamil is now significantly more powerful now having access to new spells that turn the battlefield into a glorified disco. 
but with her stronger arts comes more windows of opportunity, meaning so long as our teammates can stay alive we might be able to do this. I actually think playing this fight without arts is the much better experience, because in a regular playthrough it can be really difficult to see what's even happening on screen with all of the flashy effects playing out everywhere, and you can mostly just button spam until she drops. Here, we're really forced to slow down, learn and appropriately respond to what she's doing, which makes the fight much more interesting in my opinion. This occult dust spell is the main problem for our AI teammates. It's the one where Nazmiel starts slamming these four large boulders around, just like the legs of that Nimus pandemonium earlier. We can get people resurrected, but we're running quite low on resources and still have nearly 70,000 damage left to do. There's another disco followed by more downtime where we try to time Alphen's second boost attack slash for the exact moment she stands up in order to get even more downtime. The cycle repeats until we hit the 35,530 HP mark in which she becomes invincible in order to launch her mystic art, Dishclare Alma, dealing massive damage to the entire arena. Rinwell is immediately wiped out, then for story reasons, Alphen is also forced to fall before Nazamil drops to her knees. This looks like a loss, but it's actually a win and the story progresses. Job done. We've now unlocked that mysterious teleporter from earlier that's able to take us to the final dungeon of the game, the Keystone. But before we do that, we still have some more side content to mop up. The most unique and interesting piece of side content, in my opinion, is this rematch with Volran that takes place in Alphen's Nightmare. Volran is a whopping level 100, and just like Nazamil, he has a wide variety of skills that we need to learn and start responding to, because at first we're just getting battered. The trick is to deliberately dodge roll into his attacks to trigger powerful counter attacks, which unless I'm mistaken also charge the boost gauge. We have to be patient though because not every attack can be easily countered this way, so keeping our distance and looking for opportunities to strike is often the best strategy. Four and a half minutes into the fight he starts charging up his mystic art, the infamous Finis Aeternum, which as many viewers rightly pointed out last time can be mostly fully dodge rolled provided you get the timing and direction of the rolls correct. Volran then starts teleporting around the arena and the fight starts to feel so <laughs> epic is the word I suppose, I don't know. The fight just feels amazing to play. Shout out to the devs for creating this masterpiece. It's on the level of, if not above, many of the Soulsborne bosses. And honestly, I wish more games had this level of awesome bosses. Like, just the gameplay, oh, it's so good. I could 1v1 this guy all day and still not get bored. Eight and a half minutes in, he's charging up his mystic art again, but Alphen is able to seal the deal. That's 18k XP and a permanent upgrade to Alphen's boost attack. Very nice. Feeling confident, we go back to fight that Grinimuk that destroyed us near the beginning of the run. I want to say that we were now able to absolutely obliterate the thing, but no, despite a reasonably good start, the thing just has way too much damage and we are the ones getting obliterated before it even drops below half HP. <laughs> Don't worry though, I refuse to count this challenge run as complete until we can actually beat this thing. <laughs> We grind to a whopping level 87 while crafting a range of new accessories that focus on boosting our boost gauge charge rate, damage output and penetration. The skill panels are almost all fully complete so I think we have a really good chance now, let's do this. As always we immediately go for the tail because once we chop that off its moveset will be seriously limited and it will be at a significant disadvantage. As you can see, all boost attacks are charging much, much faster now, and since Alphen's boost attack cooldown is reduced every time an ally uses their boost attack, the effect is cumulative and we can start to get in a cycle in which the beast is regularly downed by Alphen. The downside, no pun intended, is that unlike other bosses, Gritty Muck only ever falls for a couple of seconds before getting back up to continue to dish out the pain. As a result, this was an insanely difficult 9 minute fight that Alphen didn't manage to complete. It was all thanks to our two critically low teammates that we were able to finish the thing off. Still, a win is a win. Haha, <laughs> job done. 
Alright, let's head through that teleporter and into the expansion's third and final new location, the Keystone. This place is really eerie, especially with all those masked NPCs just standing there motionless, kind of giving me flashbacks to that really creepy Doctor Who episode. Haha, <laughs> you know which one. There's a door here sealed by six elements, as well as a shortcut teleporter and a free heavy treat. The objective of this dungeon will be to complete six sub-dungeons, one for each element, which greatly vary in difficulty from ridiculously easy to borderline impossible. Before that though, we have to work our way through a fair few regular mobs, which can take quite a while because they're all souped up versions of past enemies. Okay, the first locked door is straight ahead and we need to complete the fire sub-dungeon in order to unlock it. Thankfully, the enemies here aren't too challenging because we can easily stagger the executor mob for boost strike KOs, while the flaming masses are just the latest iteration of those weak floating spellcasters. New armors are available in this dungeon, all of which reduce resistance but increase defense and elemental defense, so it's a worthwhile trade off. After finding the first of Nazamil's drawings, we're forced into a boss fight against Nazamil Nether before we can progress. I don't think it's ever explained exactly what this boss even is, just some kind of astral energy shadow, but it's going to be popping up a few times throughout this keystone dungeon and it can be fairly challenging to take down. In this first round it summons in a powerful mega wrecker to fight alongside it, which is huge and has sweeping AoE attacks, meaning it demands a lot of space in an already cramped arena. It's debatable which of the two we should take down first, but on this occasion we go for Nazmiel Nether herself, who falls after 7 minutes. That just leaves Alphen in a 1v1 against the Mega Wrecker, but with more space and less effects on screen, we can more easily focus on keeping our distance and pressuring the enemy during windows of opportunity. A couple of minutes later, the giant golem is down and we can activate the device. That's one sub-dungeon down, five to go. An ooze hive blocks the way to the next set of sub-dungeons. Regular viewers might remember us having quite a bit of trouble with one of these when we got locked into the Sisladen sewers back in our challenge run of the base game. But all of that trauma must have burned something into my brain because we're able to somehow time the dodge rolls perfectly to avoid the vast majority of its damage output. It soon goes down to an impact cross boost strike. We turn the corner in the next sub-dungeon and look who's waiting for a rematch. Yeah, we should probably prepare ourselves first because our previous encounter with this thing was way too close. We use a Ryu Golan core fragments from the first Nazmiel Nether fight to craft the ultimate weapons for Alphen and Rinwell. These reduce penetration but increase attack and elemental attack so it's a fair trade-off. Back at the training grounds, we can finally start beating the defensive and offensive medicinal herb battles for those permanent stat boosting items, but those can only be completed once every hour of in-game time, so we're kinda limited to how many we can obtain. Right, we're back at level 91 and for the first time in this entire run our gear is looking amazing. Everyone except Law has a tier 5 accessory with almost perfect stat bonuses and all skill panels have been fully completed. Let's see how this goes. Initially, our plan was to take out Nazmiel Nether first, just like last time, before I remembered that the spiky armed enemies normally have quite low HP, so it might be worth us going for that one first. This turned out to be a great decision, because we can keep the thing staggered and wipe it out in just a single minute. After that, Nazmiel Nether is obviously a complete joke who just falls a couple of minutes later. We reward ourselves by nabbing this stat enhancing herb, <laughs> sorry gargoyles, before throwing ourselves down a 200 foot drop. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that water is deep enough to survive a fall of... <laughs> you know what? Just, just never mind. <laughs> the light sub dungeon has no enemies and just consists of a machine that will cook food for you. Very nice quality of life addition there, thank you devs. Whereas the earth one is just swarming with enemies in all directions. Does anyone else think this may be just a bit too tough for us? Yes, Kisara, I definitely do. <laughs> We're level 92 for the third Nazmiel Nether fight, where she now spawns in both the giant golem and the spiky arm thingy simultaneously. Obviously, we target the latter first because of its significantly lower HP pool and higher potential damage output. And despite all this craziness on screen, we're able to get our first boost strike off on the thing in just under a minute. 
The golem comes to its defence though, so we're forced to use that heavy treat we picked up earlier to heal everyone for 3,000 each. Rinwell is down, but Spiky Boy is close behind. Okay, two left. Our next target is Nazmiel Nether, and we decide to use our first Omega Elixir here, fully reviving and healing all allies. Yeah, those are the things that the King Owl sells for 80k each. <laughs> Anyway, for some reason that I honestly can't remember, we've actually swapped over to trying to kill the golem next. I'm really not sure why. Maybe I was half asleep when I was doing this fight and forgot that Nazmiel Nether is actually easier, but hey ho. <laughs> it's down soon enough, granting us much more freedom to move around the arena. There's a lot more boost attacking now with this entire fight clocking in at a little over 8 minutes, and I'm actually surprised how well it went. She eventually falls and we're able to activate the next device, leaving only the dark sub dungeon left to go. This one looks ominous but has a simple concept, we just have to reach that thing, but instead of one party member just standing on the back of another one to reach the ledge or something sensible like that, we have to go all the way around. At this first junction we can choose between a short path with a free ore crystal, or a longer path guarded by a large mini boss. <laughs> I know which one I'm taking, yeah, <laughs> that thing looks scary. We're actually forced to fight one of these polycontrasses a little further up as the game won't allow us to sneak by it. This guy's just a reskin of the Polycephus, Polycephus, however you want to say it, optional boss from the base game. And it can be a real challenge. Saying that, I'd rather take one larger enemy like this over waves of smaller enemies like what we had earlier. We can take it down in just a couple of minutes and activate the final device. But ooh, what's behind that six element door that we passed near the start of the keystone, I hear you asking. Well, insightful imaginary viewer, whose question I just invented as a segue to the next interesting piece of information, we get seven treasure chests. These include a set of five useless astral flowers, as well as six devil's arms weapons, one for each character, whose stats scale depending on the number of enemies that that character has defeated. This means that for heroes like Isara, Law and Dohalim, the devil's arms are really bad, but for characters like Alphen, the weapons are incredibly overpowered. Nice! We sell almost everything we own to King Owl for some egregiously priced consumables, chow down on another mouth-watering wiener, and it's time for the final boss of the expansion. Here's our setup going in. We're level 93 and have almost perfect best in slot gear with all skill panels completed. Here's a quick flick through all party members art so that you can see the usage counters are exactly where they were at the start of the expansion, meaning we haven't cheated by using any arts off screen. We also haven't claimed any of the additional DLC items. Alright, let's do this after climbing a hundred flights of stairs. <laughs> Phase 1 of 3 and we're up against Captive Nazamiel, a souped up version of the Nazamiel boss we fought at the end of the second mausoleum. The fight might seem intimidating at first, but at least for the first half it's really easy to just keep her knocked down by either using Alphen's boost attack at any time or she on a Rinwell's boost attacks whenever Nazamiel is charging up a spell. This is all possible thanks to us completing the character subquests earlier. In fact, for some boost attacks like Dohalim's, you can actually tell that it's been upgraded because he now fires out three sets of vines in a row instead of just one. Before long, Nazmiel starts drawing the weapons of the five lords from the base game, such as Balsaf's axe and Ganabelt's rapier. I never actually knew that this was even a mechanic in the fight, because again, in a regular playthrough of this boss fight, there were just so many art effects flashing on screen, it's impossible to keep up. <laughs> Each of her weapons requires us to respond in a slightly different way, but for now, they're mostly manageable. Seven minutes into the fight, and she's at half HP as we get our first boost strike off, with everyone looking reasonably healthy, except for Alphen, obviously, because his boost attack inflicts damage on himself. This is where the fight picks up though, because just like before, Nazmiel now has access to much stronger spells. This includes the dreaded Dishclair Alma Mystic Art, which involves five elemental laser beams, followed by a large wave of ground explosions that can be difficult to predict or dodge. The one-time KO prevention kept our allies alive this time, but we might not be so lucky next time, so we'd really need to get our head in the game here. 
I don't have much more to say about this first phase, but I'll let a bit more of the footage play out because it was a really interesting and close fight. 13 minutes into the fight and she goes for another Mystic Art. Oh, brace yourselves everyone. Rinwell is immediately alt f 4 with Kisara and she on close behind. <laughs> Alright, Alphen, calm down. <laughs> Uh, in all seriousness, we were really lucky to get that dodge roll counter off, or else we would have been dead meat too, and the battle would have been a fail, but instead we're able to revive our teammates and continue with the boost attack rotation. Right, I'm calling this now. If Nazmiel gets an opportunity to use another Mystic Art, we are dead, so we need to win this ASAP. We're dodging her charges, but her summoned clones barrage us with a volley of magic, meaning only Tanky Kisara is still standing at a mere 278 health. Ah, oh, sod it. We're using Omega Elixir because we are not taking any risks. It's enough to ignore the clones and go all out on Nazamil, easily draining her remaining health in a matter of seconds. Nazamil! Wake up! Phase 2, and for story reasons, we're now against this level 92 oppressor. This thing has well over a million health, as well as sweeping AoE attacks, and is very quick and agile. It takes us a while to learn the timing, but we can eventually start stunlocking the thing by using Alphen's boost attack to down it, then using a couple of other boost attacks while it's down to get Alphen's back online. Then, carefully timing Alphen's next boost attack, so that the second slash hits at the exact moment that the standing up animation is due to end. This can be repeated to almost infinitely keep the thing down throughout the first half. <laughs> yeah, you can see why I was so keen to have all those boost gauge cooldown buffs on our accessories now. Just under 6 minutes into the fight, its knees are down so we're onto the base of the tail next. But again, we just stunlock it with boost attacks so the poor thing barely has any time to attack or even move. It takes us about 11 minutes to finally get it to half HP and trigger the second boost strike. Okay, second half and just like Nazamil, this thing becomes much more aggressive and powerful now. Boost attacks don't always work for some reason and we're starting to run low on healing items. We try to put some distance between us while it's charging up, but it soon unleashes its mystic art Dispilataga Alma, which is a series of arena-wide ice explosions that deal massive damage. We use the invincibility frames of Alphen's boost attack to try to keep him alive before going for a heavy treat. This was a bit risky and in hindsight maybe we should have gone with an Omega Elixir there, but hindsight is 2020 as the phrase goes. Nine more minutes pass, and we're now in a 1v1 against the Beast with Alphen at 1 HP. We throw an Elixir at Kisara in the hopes that she can stay alive if Alphen falls for any reason, and just continue to push the attack. 2,000 hell, 500... Now! Take our hand! No! Never! Time for the final phase, and oh damn this thing is ugly! <laughs> During this part, the beast is completely invincible to all attacks, cannot be stunned or downed, and has an unknown amount of health. It's jumping everywhere and we can't keep up. Could this be the end of the run? Will we fall at the final hurdle? Well... That's right, this is actually an awesome scripted event where you get to unleash everything you have on the boss while being completely invincible yourself. Soon enough, there's an epic cutscene in which Nazamil's dish clear armor slaughters the beast, and we all live happily ever after. Can you beat Tales of Arises Beyond the Dawn DLC without arts on Chaos Difficulty without any bonus items or additional DLC? Yes you can, and it was awesome. Let me know what you guys thought of the run down in the comments, and even leave a suggestion for an RPG that you'd like to see featured on the channel. For now though, it's goodbye from our friends on Planet Dana. See you later everyone. Cheers.